I would like to uh, take this opportunity to thank uh, all the speakers today, including the uh, Dr. Lamas, uh, Chris Han, uh, Professor Tan, uh, Colin, uh, uh, Professor Reynolds, and uh, uh, also Dr. Jen. Well, uh, they all contribute a lot uh, in enlightening us the, the different aspects on the education on emergency medicine. So uh, it's time for the panel discussion. For those who would like to raise a question to any of the speakers today, please type it in the chat box and our moderator will handle them. So I will pass the time to Res and uh, Kevin. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Dr. Res Lam from the Department of Emergency Medicine, the University of Hong Kong. So hi, uh, my name is Kevin. I'm from the Chinese University and uh, please again, uh, feel free to type in your questions into the chat box. We've seen some discussion already and maybe we can elaborate on them. Yeah, maybe I, I, might, I read the first question. Uh, there's a question for Professor Tam from Singapore. Um, he asked about uh, how about the career pathway for clinical educators? Creating an educational pathway is considered friendly to uh, clinical educators. Um, and they're still working on how to assist the uh, clinical educators uh, to succeed in their career. So instead of looking at the impact factors of publications, uh, how do you value the teachings of your clinical educators in your setting? Thank you very much for the question. So um, uh, when we go back to look at how Singapore conceptualized the need for educators and not just in emergency medicine, but across the whole of Singapore. One of the things that we did as a nation is in all the hospitals, I'm talking about the public hospitals and that's where majority of the emergency physicians are employed. In every doctor's annual appraisal, mm -hmm. teaching KPIs are part and parcel of the appraisal. Mm -hmm. So therefore, uh, that is one of the fundamental things that we put in place. Uh, we acknowledge that um, every doctor has a responsibility to teach. For those doctors, and there are very few of them who opt out of teaching, then uh, their annual appraisal would be configured slightly differently. But for the majority of us, teaching is part and parcel of the work that we do. And for a lot of the hospitals, 10% of every, every doctor's time is set aside for teaching, and there are KPIs to measure that 10% of work. So that's the, the foundational layer. On top of that, if um, uh, somebody is identified for uh, the, the educator, the clinician educator track, whether this is with the university or with the residency program, because uh, funding is available for both sets of le learners, then the KPIs will increase because now this person is expected to take on the additional role of either the scholar or the education leader. And so then more time is set aside. That means they would uh, let go of more of the clinical time and their KPIs for all the additional roles will add up to justify the time that they need to, uh, to, to put aside to do education. So in that way, that's how we protect the work of the educators. And the KPIs for an education scholar versus a KPI for an education leader naturally will have to be the same. And therefore, for a leader, we don't look at publication, the number of publications and the impact factor. We look at strategic uh, decision that are then implemented into teaching activities or assessment activities because that's how you measure a leader and not by the publications which is a very honestly a very narrow way of looking at the uh, academic uh, medical education so I hope that helps thank you would other speakers like to respond to uh, Professor Tam's comment uh, this is Dr. Ram Krishnan from India. Uh, a big hello to all the speakers. I think it's very important for us to identify that uh, whether the person is a good clinician who can teach or a person who is an educator who is more interested in uh, actually publishing and things like that. So you have to identify the talent that the person is having. And I feel you have to give equal weightage for both. Only then uh, everybody can progress in the department. Otherwise, you have people... Uh, who are only interested in publishing, who are not very good uh, with, with their clinical skills. And uh, just uh, like a joke, a person who doesn't have clinical skills starts writing a book. And a person, you know, that's what usually happens. And so, uh, I mean, that's just a joke from my part. But I think you have to identify people with good clinical skills 
and encourage them so that I think a lot of learning happens in the bedside also, not just by reading books. And uh, not everything can be taught uh, uh, by reading a book. So I think it's very important to keep that in mind. Com completely agree with all of that. I mean, the, um, the thing I keep raising at my own institution is, and Kevin will know this already, is the fact that um, we have increased the number of students astronomically, as Tim mentioned, but there's still only two academic emergency physicians. So uh, as, as Kam Ying mentioned, the, the reality is that we can't rely on universities to, to provide the teaching on its own. Um, and in fact, I think it's, it's a dying model, certainly in Hong Kong. I can't see how we can do that long term because there isn't going to be the, um, the drive to join academia in a traditional context, as Professor Ramakrishnan just said. You know, the, the idea that we can all do research and teaching and clinical and admin and mentoring and everything else all at the same time. I don't think it was ever possible, but I don't think it's even remotely possible moving forward. So we're going to have to have educators. We're going to have to have researchers. We all need a clinical core. That is undoubted. I think that's the foundation of what we do. But I don't think it's feasible to do everything long term in the way that we've done it traditionally. The universities, certainly my own institution, is not going to invest a huge amount of money only in teaching. They're a research intensive institution. And then I think it comes down to the model that um, Kam Young um, expanded on beautifully, the, the, the having the uh, educational system, whether that be government or colleges or a hospital authority, but the, 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 the institution that will invest in the future of our clinical service, I think has to have ownership of that education pathway, whether it be, uh, whether we call it a clinical academic teacher or a clinical educator, whatever terms we use, that's where it has to come from. Um, so I think is a, Singapore, I think, leads the way with this undoubtedly, and we have much to learn. Max, I think you have a follow-up question, right, uh, for Professor Tam? Yes, and I, I do, yes. Um, well, actually, uh, the professional, uh, professionalization of uh, medical education in Singapore is really, really impressive. I, I'm just wondering, how did you persuade the minister in Singapore to commit resources? For example, 0 0.2 FTE for teaching, I think it's really, really impressive. How, how did you do that? <laughs> so um, the, this is the part where uh, I am one of those in Singapore who, are, who, who is very grateful to the Americans. So when the Ministry of Health um, Singapore uh, was a British colony and we broke away in 1965 and for the first uh, 30 years all the way up to uh, the, the, 19, the late 1980s, um, our uh, postgraduate training system was very slow moving and really very underdeveloped. But uh, by the 90s, the realization is that uh, whether it is surgeon or emergency physicians or uh, or, or any specialists, there must be a formalized structure. And we actually went with the British model of uh, Royal College exams and a traineeship for almost 15 to 20 years. And the realization, of course, is that um, it isn't quite what uh, Singapore is looking for. So we went out on an international shopping trip to a few big countries. Uh, and the Minister for Health at that moment decided that the American residency system fitted our needs a lot better. And that's when in 2009 to 2010, we paid many, many, many millions to the Americans. And we brought in almost lock, stock and barrel, the residency program. So that was the game changer because the Americans were very clear about this. No faculty, no tutor is going to be able to do a good job teaching your residents if you don't buy out their time and free them up from some clinical work so that they can concentrate on teaching your residents. So the Americans really helped us tremendously. And we all wrote in the back of and said, yes, that's right. That's what we need. And so that was important because once um, the Ministry of Health and therefore with the whole of government said that, okay, we're going to set aside the money needed year after year, and this is going to be sustainable for the, for, for the future to buy out 
doctor's time in order for them to take on the teacher, the assessor, the welfare officer role, the medical school came on board and said, we want that too. If you're going to invest time and money getting the faculty out to teach your residents, don't you think the medical students deserve that? Because in Singapore, emergency medicine rotation for the medical students is mandatory. So two to three years later, the funding for the medical students followed as well. And that's where we are today. So even though we are divorcing the Americans after learning from them, you know, for the past decade, I am very grateful because they made this happen. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Tam. I think um, it's a good learning lesson and how we convince our politicians on the investments and especially on the return. I think that's a great part as well. Uh, looking forward to perhaps reading more and if Singapore can share, you know, the, re the return for their investment, I think that will be a very important and useful case. So we have a question from Axel uh, to Tim. Um, talking about the human factor uh, considered in education, um, not maybe perhaps by lecturing, but uh, perhaps if Professor Reina can teach us, you know, a bit about how to be, how to teach uh, students to be more or colleagues to be more empathetic. Well, of course, it's a challenging question, and it's especially challenging when you have a lot of people and few teachers. Um, uh, I think one needs to look at things at different levels of the training program for emergency medicine. First of all, a uh, medical student, and then trainees, and then higher level. Uh, one needs to accept that uh, different cultures um, have certain models that make such one-to-one uh, -one, uh, experience uh, harder than, than others. But I, I think that one needs to brainstorm. Uh, I mean, in my talk, there were a number of, of um, I don't know if you call them bombshells, but there are a number of, of, of um, different potential directives and each one needs to be considered in its own right. Uh, for example, let me give an example, uh, let me, uh, Colin may be able to, uh, the details are a bit hazy for me, but when Colin and I were working in Edinburgh, one of our consultants um, put together a program. Now, I can't remember how long medical students were attached to the emergency department, whether it was two, four, six or eight weeks, but it was a significant time. How many? Two, two weeks. So during that two week period, every medical student was attached to a doctor and came on with that doctor for their shift. And that doctor saw patients, interacted, did investigations, went through life. And that medical student was almost like their best buddy um, for two weeks. Uh, and then that was it, two weeks gone. At the end of the year, the emergency medicine program of all the programs in the final year was voted the best program by the medical student, hands down, hands down. Um, no other program came anywhere near. Um, uh, secondly, when the department in Edinburgh advertised for trainees, it was one of the few departments in the country that was competitive. There would be 10 places, there would be 100 applicants. Um, so that's starting at grassroots. Now, you need a major mindset, you need a change in mindset uh, in the leadership of departments to acknowledge that you're going to invest time into teaching, as opposed to pushing through four to eight patients an hour, uh, you know, don't delay. I mean, that's a, that's a major mindset. Um, and, and, and I suppose this is the difference maybe between uh, programs in the UK, uh, I don't know what it's like in Singapore, maybe Australia, and in Hong Kong, is that mindset of investing lots of time in medical students um, versus 
patient flow, patient flow, patient flow. It's a very different mindset. Uh, the next thing, Colin mentioned that, um, you know, the Asian mindset and the, the Hong Kong mindset, mindset maybe especially is nervous, is anxious about, you know, infectious disease and uh, it's cultural. Um, I, I, I think whether it's um, uh, a healthy perspective, uh, we could discuss, but uh, it's a reality. You know, people are afraid of, of this sort of thing, whereas in the UK, it's a very different mindset and probably the US and probably Australia to a degree also. So, you know, different mindsets, you need to adapt to the culture. The concept of discipleship, uh, I think can run, run through the whole program, but obviously it's most relevant to small groups. So the issue is that if we have trainees that show real potential, they've come through medical school, you know, they, they are excited about emergency medicine and they're interested in the specialty. Should we be trying to focus and target on them, uh, target them? to encourage them, find out their interests, develop opportunities and get them on that high trajectory pathway that they're, they're motivated towards doing, um, but there aren't the opportunities. And because there aren't the opportunities, one or two years later, okay, bye-bye, you know. And, but they were, they were gunning for us. They wanted to be emergency doctors, you know, there's no doubt. But then the way the system's put together, oh well. This needs a lot more, you know, discussion in a different forum. But today is a matter of, you know, feeding ideas. Can I add a couple of things to that? Um, I think that's a superb answer, Tim. I think the... Um, to, to go back to your comment on Edinburgh, I mean, you're right, we were immersed with the students and the students were immersed with us. And I think that comes back as well to, to the, the other point that Kam Ying mentioned about um, role modelling. You know, when you're with people who are, you aspire to be like them. And I mean, you and I both know we had some phenomenal teachers in our early years and, and, and you just wanted to be like them. And I think that ties in with my own comment about that lack of exposure. If you're not seeing that on a, on a real-time basis, it's very hard to be inspired. And, and as you know, and, and I'm, I can't speak for Hong Kong, you of course, but I mean, our, our time with the students now in sixth year at CUHK is very short, it's eight days. And the reality is they only get to spend a very, very small number of hours directly seeing what happens, never mind participating, just seeing it. So I think that has to increase if we're going to get buy-in, certainly in Hong Kong. I think other countries, um, Professor Ramakrishnan and Dr. Chang and, and Professor Tam have all said they have a longer period than us. I'm all for it. Again, though, we need to have clinician educators who can take that on because the academics uh, we simply, there aren't enough bodies on the ground to do it. But I think coming back to the, the question that Axel raised, I think empathetic physicians come from role modeling more than anything else. You have to see a good physician do that, touching someone's hand or hand on the shoulder or just get an eye contact and saying, I'm here for you. Even if I can't save you, I'm here to comfort you, to help you, to give you your last drugs or whatever it happens to be. It's so important and you can't get that from any other place other than whether you call it mentorship, discipleship, role modeling. I think all of them are different but parallel um, systems that work. Thank you, Colin. Um, so next we have a question again from Axel uh, to Arab. Uh, Agra, thank you for your introduction and great project. Our students are uh, um, have some feedback and they, they love uh, the e-learning. So we, we have also uh, made use of your resources uh, during, especially early, early during the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, just wondering, uh, Axel asked about any difficulty in promulgating your project. Uh, I think the research you, you showed is very interesting um, with the low middle income uh, or especially low income areas. Uh, perhaps uh, any 
insights on how to maybe overcome that in the next phase? Yeah, thank you. Uh, actually, the starting for the, at the beginning, the, how we can uh, to share these resources with the people who needs really, it was kind of difficult. Uh, because uh, the, like every project, you have to have a team members and enough number of team members. And we all emergency physicians and we are really busy physicians. Uh, so the, everything we do in any uh, extracurricular, let's say the projects, it's a, it's a kind of uh, actually depending on our free time. And also it's it depending on the free time for other uh, the contributors, uh, if they want to involve with any project uh, such as our project. So at the beginning, yeah, the finding the uh, really, really interested uh, people to help us to share these resources in their country, in their region or in the, around the world. But uh, by the time uh, we are reaching a lot of uh, uh, the people uh, who are really interested to share these free resources with everybody. So it's a kind of uh, time dependent process. So it will it will be it will be somewhere in the high level in some point. But the current level, I, th I think, is we, we are really grateful and we are really happy. Uh, as, as I showed the, at the first month, the uh, first three month of testing period, you know, who are using it, where are they using? Uh, so it was actually really really. Uh, the, the sad moment for us, actually, we didn't aim to reach the high uh, and very well developed countries at all. Actually, we aim to reach the, the resource limited settings, but we, we failed in three months. And then uh, communicating with the, the, the various regions and the countries from different uh, level of uh, development or the income, or let's say the, the resource settings types, and the different level of uh, the contributors, I think it, it helped us to widen the, our audience, widen our reach. Uh, so it, it, it's still growing. Uh, the, the currently we have almost 41 countries uh, already contributed to this project and it's, it's growing and it will grow anyway. But as I said, it's, a, it's depending on your time, how much you, time you can give. And even actually, we know that the, the, our educators in many countries don't have protected time to teach their residents and medical students. They work full time clinically, and then they teach the resident. And this is this is this is not fair. This is not really really. Uh, yeah, it's not right. <laughs> anyway, but I, I'm glad that the Singapore has a chance to change it. So hopefully, uh, that everybody can do that. Uh, so uh, at the moment. Uh, what we can do to reach low and lower middle income countries. I think this is really still a question. Uh, like this type of events. Now we are trying to communicate with, for example, with the African uh, Society Federation uh, for Emergency Medicine to involve with their uh, the scientific activities, their you know, other communication, you know, everything. So, and we are increasing our editors, for example, from Africa, South America, and Asia. And uh, so actually it helped us a lot to reach those resources, but still the technology is not there in some countries uh, who are really need the good emergency care. Uh, they don't have enough resources. They don't have enough uh, internet access. So it's okay. Uh, the, the, what we can do for this in this era, I think uh, uh, the Colin already mentioned uh, the books are still is a good good thing to have. Uh, so uh, the the published book we have one book in, in PDF and iBook format, for example, it can be you know download easily. So so far I guess it it downloaded more than ten thousand times, whatever. But uh, they can print it out and then they can keep it in their shelf. So uh, I think that at the moment this is the only type of option for some places. Uh, but again uh, the the publicity, you know, advertisements, and using these free resources and sharing them with, you know, other people who can, you know, get benefit. It's good. I think. I, I think the uh, the developed system has uh, little issues about the tra their training. Uh, the most of them has enough manpower. Most of them maybe may have, you know, uh, protected time, at least for their students, but. Uh, this is this is not actually the issue. Uh, the issue is uh, the students 
who don't have that resources, who don't have enough number of emergency medicine trained, you know, teachers, and who don't have, you know, electronic resources in their medical school, or who don't have enough number of books uh, to read and learn. So, uh, so I, it's still, still a big challenge, but uh, we are trying our best to reach them. Uh, but to, to your question, honestly, there is no clear cut, you know, answer uh, how we can reach. We will try every other. Yeah, I guess it's still early days, as you say, and um, with the commitment and increasing investment from, you know, everyone around the world, I think things would change and, and improve. And I think the, the point you said is very right about, you know, how do we reach the most difficult to reach uh, people and in, uh, international societies from around the world. I, I, I meet a lot of delegates like in conferences and education activities where you know, uh, the developed or high income countries are funding uh, places for, you know, low middle income countries to participate. And I think that's, you know, a great trend. And I'm sure through these events, uh, things will, will change. And when, you know, technology is available, then uh, I guess people will take up more of these valuable resources like yours. Thank you, Arif. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I see that Colin has a uh, point, um, but maybe I just point to, um, Dr. Zhang, before I hand over to Rex for um, his further sort of questions. Um, Dr. Zhang, um, from Taiwan, I think you mentioned about data-driven residency training uh, in your last slide. And I'm very curious because I think um, there is a lot of data that we collect, certainly for training, for examination, um, but whether it can sort of drive our agenda and curriculum. Um, just wondering what your thoughts on that and how perhaps we could all learn from the data that we collect. Um, Dr. Zhang? Yes, uh, thanks for this great question. Um, actually, um, when do teaching and learning in workplace, it's been uh, very difficult because emergency uh, daily practice is shift by shift and even the clinical teacher and the learner cannot be a couple at all. They always the uh, random or sometimes they need to uh, put more effort to link the teacher and the learner. So um, we aim to consider use the data driven uh, to make our educational um, project a reform. Uh, for example, when implement CPME, we do EPA, do milestone, and uh, we also uh, do a CCC uh, every six months to check their progress. Of course, everything cannot be very mature so far, but we still strive for this and uh, develop some electronic system. And the system also can um, present the uh, visual uh, figure for the uh, milestone 23 uh, by months or by, by times. And also we right now has developed seven uh, EPA to present um, or distinguish our emergency this specialty from other specialty. Um, of course, we also do some qualitative research. Um, for example, if we um, teach the medical students, they um, rotate to emergency department, we also offer the simulation training what kind of the role of the simulation training they field? Um, because we consider emergency department is a community of practice and uh, medical students, they are newcomer. For newcomer, the, the belief, the, the norm or the daily practice, they are not familiar with that. So um, join the emergency learning for two weeks um, to some extent like the socialization process. So we should use the social science, the point of view to examine or look at what they think about themselves uh, during the, uh, the two weeks the rotation. So once we have this kind of a sense, we can uh, do some more study and uh, do reform of our curriculum and also to check uh, everything they contact in ED. For example, I also do the uh, interview and uh, to collect the qualitative data to understand why there is very difficult for them to engage in the emergency department because very fast pace, very critical event, they have no role to be engaged sometimes. So we need to uh, do faculty development. We need to do um, 
uh, time management and also to improve our teaching and learning. Like the, the trick I present today is the entrustment decision and the feedback receptivity. What is the impact um, they feel from their button of hearts? Sometimes the medical student cannot say anything because they just think they are outsider if we didn't prepare for them to be engaged. So this is why I say we need some um, clinical teacher to be social scientist and to be educator, to design some study, to provide more information we can assess to improve our teaching and learning. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Jen. Uh, I have one question for all speakers, because uh, in Hong Kong, we are now reviewing our EM curriculum for trainees. One difficulty we face is uh, it's really hard to assess uh, professionalism of our trainees. Can our speakers share with us uh, in your setting, how do you assess and how do you measure? Because I noticed that in uh, Professor Tam's slide, I also see that there is a KPI for that. So can you share with us how do you measure that quantitatively? Thank you very much for this invitation. So um, we, we adopted the American model of emergency medicine uh, as our main curriculum. And that's a very detailed curriculum that deals with all the core bread and butter topics. Where Singapore added was uh, to code all the every line and topic inside there with a three code system. Code one, code two, and three. Three are the absolute essential where every resident at the, at the end of five years of residency must know from diagnosis, information gathering, all the way to management, including recognizing and managing complications. Then code two topics are the kind of bread and butter, but uh, they should encounter, but we don't need to, them to know in such great depth. And code three topics, because this is an American curriculum that we are adapting. So there are some really super cold topics like hypothermia that Singapore would never see and therefore they're quoted number one. What we've added are all the things that are unique to Singapore, including our uh, interpretation of what uh, we want to see in, our, in, in the professional behavior as part of the identity formation for our residents. So we don't have a test, that means we don't make them sit for a, uh, an MCQ test, but embedded in uh, the OSCE that they take as part of their intermediate exams, embedded in the uh, teaching portfolio and exit exam as well, are the essential things like uh, ethical decision-making, uh, professional behavior, and that is also one of the competencies that we adopted from the American uh, residency system where professionalism on its own have specific milestones that our residents need to meet. I believe uh, Dr. Chang from Taiwan would be familiar with this because Singapore and Taiwan have taken on board the milestone system built on the six competencies from the American residency system. So there is assessment. The assessment are a lot more qualitative, even though we built in multi-source feedback on an annual basis and some components in the multi-source feedback ref, uh, reflects the professionalism part. Uh, um, it is not the only way we look at it. So faculty feedback, peers feedback, uh, nurses and other colleagues feedback, they all come together to make sure that um, part of the professional identity formation, this appropriate behavior is taken on board. So I hope that helps to answer the question. Thank you, Dr. Chen. Would you like to share with us your experience in Taiwan? Um, actually, uh, I totally agree with Dr. Sam because um, um, professional professionalism is very difficult to use the uh, quantitative uh, assessment, but of course, it's, it's also doable. Uh, we do 36, uh, 30, 60 uh, evaluation from the nurse, the, the peer, and the, his clinical teacher or other stakeholder uh, who contact with the learner and they can also rating uh, their accountability or uh, on duty on time, or uh, how about their communication with the patient, uh, be patient to everything, or is there any um, clinical error um, he make or how to uh, encounter or um, to face the, the situation. All of these are uh, very much like how society look at the physician. So we just uh, uh, to figure out the, the best uh, model of the, the physician in emergency workplace and how 
their distance is far from the, the role model or, or just very close, still can consider some kinds of a professionalism evaluation. Thank you, thank you. So are there any more questions from our audience? Please type your questions uh, in the chat box. Uh, are there any more comments from our speakers? If not, I think it's time to uh, ask Essel to make a closing remark. Thank you, Rex. Uh, uh, indeed, I would like to thank uh, all the speakers again. Uh, I think we all agree that uh, this afternoon is really very fruitful on the discussion and also the knowledge sharing on how to educate our next generations, uh, including both medical students and also our residents, because uh, uh, how to sustain our specialty is one of the hot issues that uh, we take uh, different uh, occasion to, to, to discuss a lot. And uh, the, um, definitely I, I learned a lot from, the, uh, from our uh, overseas speakers uh, on some of the aspects, especially the, uh, the introductions of the uh, teaching skills in the resident programs and also different kinds of the KPI, something like that on, on this kind of educators related issues. I hope that everybody will be, will agree and uh, to will to join me to pick a give big hand to all the speakers. And uh, before we end this session, so I would like to uh, into uh, uh, we we will we will we'll post up the, the the QR code for the CMD later. But before that, I would like to invite all the speakers to turn on their camera so that we can take a big pictures uh, uh, together to memorize this uh, great moment. Maybe everybody should open the cameras, I guess. Yeah, yes, that's, that's uh, good. <laughs> okay, uh, if you like, you can uh, turn on your camera too to join us for this, so for the photo uh, uh, shooting. So uh, is there anybody who want to turn on the camera? I can't free. Okay. Uh, free. Two. <laughs> okay, someone joining. Okay, I, I delay my convert. <laughs> <laughs> so okay, okay, three, two, one. Smile, everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. <laughs> so uh, uh, we will post up the the two uh, QR book for those uh, local to uh, trainees and also fellows so that they can uh, get their CMD points. For those not from Hong Kong and uh, they still want to get the electronic uh, uh, certificate of attendance, please uh, send an email to the to our official email Asian Society EM at gmail.com to uh, request for the electronic certificate of the uh, attendance. But please make sure that you type you tell us your uh, your login names in the Zoom because we need to double check because we don't know your true name. If you are not using the true name in the Zoom today, please let us know your true name and the login name today. So uh, uh, enjoy the today and uh, stay healthy and uh, goodbye everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank, Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, sir. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.